Probably most people will find this timeline of the history of the Earth so unusual that they will decide that this is some sort of historic fiction. My actual intention is far from writing a fictional story. These are simply the main conclusions about the history of the Earth based on all reliable sources that I could find so far. This presentation will be only about the conclusions. The countless reasons for which I consider this particular timeline to be closest to the truth, at least to best of my knowledge so far, you can find in all the hundreds of videos on the New Earth video channel. Although the Earth is extremely old and countless civilizations, groups of souls have come here to participate in this theater, our idea of what history is is applicable to only relatively recent civilizations, because before that this theater play that we call life was in other dimensions and other timelines which we cannot comprehend. For example, before the human civilizations, there were wise races of dragons inhabiting the Earth. So then let's start with what we can actually comprehend. And that's a human civilization very much like ours. They had cities, which looked like our cities, they had cars, very similar to us. And at the point where they reached a technological development more or less of the type which we have reached in our stage of evolution, or maybe devolution, at that point they simply blew themselves up completely in a nuclear war. After that tragic scene of the grand theater called Earth, many of the souls, seeing that their playgrounds for incarnation and reincarnation was destroyed, they left for other spheres, maybe you will call them planets, to find a new home and incarnate in different theaters. But a fraction of that old group of souls remained. And later on, when the Earth recovered from the nuclear disaster and was populated by the engineers again with primitive species of man, then the experienced souls formed their own smaller civilization, which resided underground, while on the surface Cavemen and giants roamed the earth. We call this civilization Lemuria, or Mu. They call themselves Lumanians. Mostly, they were centered underground on this continent of Mu, which, in a very rough area, was uh, more or less the Indian Ocean, also the continents of Australia, Africa, Asia, and so on. But all this is just to give you a general idea, because at that time the outlines of the continents were quite different. Most of the Lumanians would be geniuses according to our standards and they had very highly developed telepathic abilities. They used sound technologies with which they could easily make the underground tunnels and dwellings in which they lived and they were magicians of technology in every respect. The Lumanian experiment for a human civilization came to an end very soon because the Lumanians modified themselves, modified their very race in such a way to avoid violence and aggression which destroyed the mother civilization from which they sprouted. 
they modified themselves into a race which was so fearful and feeble that it was no longer suitable for the earth which is a place of strongly contrasting dualities place where souls come for a fast-track learning experience Although the cavemen were relatively simple people, and more or less what we've heard about them in school is correct, still there are aspects of their lives which we ignore simply because we cannot comprehend. For example, they were capable of clearly perceiving spirits. This idyllic setting of beautiful green planet full of exotic animals and plants and inhabited by relatively unsophisticated cavemen attracted many races from other places or spheres of existence. In simple language, people call them planets. They came and settled as numerous colonies on Earth. There were no worldwide advanced civilizations after the one which blew itself up in a nuclear war, but there were numerous groups of advanced races which coexisted with the cavemen. The most famous of them is Atlantis. The original Atlanteans who landed on Earth were beings of light and goodness and had unimaginable for us level of technological knowledge in terms of crystals and other things which are far beyond us currently. But since the Earth is a place of duality, eventually they got infiltrated by the forces of evil. And the sick ambitions of those forces went far beyond further than destroying the paradise of the Atlanteans. They also foolishly dared to embark on corrupting the subtle guardian angel, so to say, spheres, layers of the earthly existence. At that point, the keepers of the time decided that it is time to end the Atlantean experiment and the full thing, the full island, sunk into the ocean, probably the Pacific Ocean, in what now most people would call naively natural disaster. Well, in older times, people called it differently and they were closer to the truth. In school they told us that they were hunter-gatherers in those times, and that's also true, but some of them were more advanced than me and you in every respect, even in terms of technology. How? If they happened to be one of those tribes which was in touch with the various advanced races who were coming and going and making the Earth home for some time, they could have easily had access to higher technology than us nowadays. And that is why amongst the artifacts of really primitive ancient settlements, sometimes objects are found which we cannot duplicate nowadays. We don't have tools which could cut so precisely or polish without damaging a given fragile material and so on. Such findings may appear mysterious as long as we ask the wrong question. How could those primitive people make such things? But if we view it from the right perspective of this overall situation of various advanced races coming and going, then there is no mystery, then everything falls into place. 
So let's look further into this parallel between the advanced hunter-gatherer and the primitive modern person, me, for example. The hunter-gatherer didn't have a dishwasher, but he didn't even need one, because much tastier and healthier food would be freely available if he only walks out of the door. We tend to assume that all primitive people were less educated than us, but this was not the case. Those few who were in touch with advanced races from other spaces who came with good intentions, they were far better informed in terms of cosmology and history than the modern man. We think, we imagine that we know everything because they are showing us some digital images of Mars and I don't know what else. But are they really genuine? Don't forget that we were told lies about landing on the moon and that we are being told lies about some international space station which swallows billions as funding and yet has not produced even a single scientific result which would help humanity in any way. So possibly even a caveman or a hunter and gatherer would have known more about the cosmos than us just because he had a genuine source of knowledge. The area which now approximately corresponds to the place of the North Pole currently was landmass, beautiful tropical paradise. It was inhabited by a wise race of people. They were noble and honest. We don't really know what was their connection with the island of Atlantis. Were they a fraction of the good people of Atlantis? Were they even connected in any way with the Atlantis, the island in the ocean? Hard to say at this point, but it seems that they existed even after the sinking of Atlantis. And they were kind to the primitive earthly inhabitants. They educated them, and in return, the simple tribal people revered them as gods. Back then, the position of the land masses on Earth and the poles was radically different. All of a sudden, the beautiful paradise of the North Pole was turned into an uninhabitable, frozen, dead land. Seen from the perspective of the modern timeline, in which most people believe, these events should have happened some 12,000 years ago. But the timing in reality is absolutely wrong. First of all, because these calculations are based on absolutely unreliable dating methods, and second of all, due to cleverly introduced new calendars and due to fraudulent rewriting of history, the historic timestamp, the entire timeline, as we've heard it in school, is so distorted that it barely deserves to be called history anymore. Probably the Hyperborean paradise was destroyed relatively not so long ago because the mammoths, which froze instantly while chewing with the grass in their mouth, they are still quite fresh when they defrost them. They are used as source of food till date by the locals in Siberia. Their blood is sometimes still flowing when their frozen bodies get defrosted. Can it be really by chance that the traditional Nordic history tells us about an evil race of giants who used the technique of instant freezing as a weapon? Yes, there were giants, bad giants, good giants, there were dwarves, dragons, 
and all the other creatures that we hear about from the fairy tales. The traditional fairy tales are much more close to the actual ancient history of the earth than the historic fantasies preached in the brainwashing institutions called schools. Numerous bone remains of giants have been found to testify to their existence. And, as far as the races of the dwarves, well, they were openly in contact with people. Up to a couple of hundred years ago in Siberia, and their abandoned dwellings are to be found at many places in Europe and Asia. They are obviously too small for us, not only in the sense of fitting inside comfortably, but also in many cases we simply can't get through the door. Official sources suggest that they were made by kids or all kinds of similarly silly stories. And I can accept that even kids in those times could have been smarter than us. But on the other hand, looking at the actual size of the dwellings and the tunnels, the shadow of doubt creeps into my mind. Really, did toddlers engineer a network of tunnels kilometers long? Did they dig it into the solid bedrock? The dinosaurs also coexisted with people, and not millions of years ago, but in the very recent past. We have numerous medieval depictions of dinosaurs and dragons, and they are depicted with vivid and minor details. We can confirm that those details are true by examining their skeletons, but how did the medieval artists know those details if they didn't have more or less direct contact with the animals. One particular place on earth stands out amongst all others in terms of the richness of the ancient history, and that's Egypt. Various races, both human-like and unlike, made Egypt their home through the ages. One can see how did these races look like from the ancient Egyptian art. Very high levels of knowledge were revealed to the ancient Egyptians. Initially, it was for everybody, and at the later stages it became a privilege of the priests and the rulers only. The source of the knowledge were not only the advanced races, but also a souls that I will call speakers. The primary reason for which the souls of the speakers come into human bodies is to spread genuine knowledge. They are kind of the human form representatives of the Adityas, the kind and benevolent engineers of the universe. When a given soul incarnates on earth, its memories are partially suppressed. Otherwise, the incarnated person wouldn't be able to benefit from the learning process on earth. If our memories were not hidden to some extent, then our earthly life would be like showing up for a test while you have all the answers and the questions in your pocket. But when the souls of the speakers incarnate, often they would have their memories hidden to a lesser extent compared to the people around them. Jesus Christ is the perfect example of such a soul of a speaker which came in human body, and there were many of them in ancient Egypt. When did the civilization develop over there? We have no clue. Some even say that some of the ships of the people of Atlantis landed in Egypt. Although we don't know when it all started, we know when did it end, and that is to be measured with hundreds of years, not thousands for sure. 
because on the walls of the so-called ancient Egyptian temples there are entire passages of the Bible carved, amongst plentiful other evidence. Basically, up until Napoleon went and destroyed everything, the Mamelukes were safeguarding the heritage from the old wise races. They were remotely connected to the Hyperborean line of earth education, so to say. And the Hyperboreans were also on the light side. And that is why the medieval travelers who visited Egypt described the pyramids as being in top condition and well maintained. So when were the pyramids and the rest of the Egyptian temples which we see nowadays built? Well, everything that consists of uh, more or less medium size or smaller building blocks that would be maximum thousand years or so old. Even if it has traces of very advanced technology, even as close as 1000 or 2000 years ago, there was high technology, probably beyond our imagination even, at least for certain groups in the society in Egypt. Now, what we see on many of the archaeological sites in Egypt is that on the top we have a structure of uh, medium-sized or small stone, relatively, at least in megalithic terms. But then in the bases we have really giant stones and much higher quality of masonry work. Now those, along with places like the Osirian and the Sphinx, could be indeed older. As the earth was getting ready for the dark ages of the arrogant people, places with highly developed civilizations were just obliterated, archived. We don't know how exactly Sahara was formed, the wide range of um, official hypotheses don't seem to hold much water, and even the type of sand of which Sahara is made raises so many questions to the point that even mainstream researchers doubt its earthly origin. But we know the history of another desert in the vicinity of the Egyptian desert, and the story sounds very similar area very pleasant for habitation with beautiful lush greenery turns into a desert in a blink. And that's the desert around the Dead Sea. On one side we get details of how Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed from the Bible, which is confirmed by the bowls of almost pure sulfur, which can be put on fire even till date and they are found in a certain small area on the shores of the Dead Sea. And on the other hand, we have the molten, flowing stone in Petra, which is again part of that desert area around the Dead Sea. Stone, unlike ice cream, doesn't melt just like that if you leave it under the sun. It's hard for us to imagine what could have melted something the size of Petra, kilometers long. But if you really want to know the origin of the deserts, this needs to be seriously researched. Currently, we live in a crazy age, crazy times of violence, total moral decay, thick ignorance, misery of every sort and description. It seems these dark ages started some 1000 years ago and are about to end towards the end of this century. We shouldn't feel unlucky to have been born in such an era. This is just a difficult test and nothing else. Even very advanced souls who have had incarnations in Atlantis and other centers of advanced society, 
Even they, absolutely voluntarily, have taken birth among us. Considering the difficult conditions are simply greater opportunities for learning. And most likely, our Savior Jesus Christ, a prominent figure among the speakers, appeared 1,000 years ago, in the beginning of the Dark Ages. So all these characteristics of the Dark Age that we listed, they all come in the package. They go hand in hand. To be violent and arrogant, one must be ignorant about the laws of the universe. In this particular example, he would be unaware of the karmic sequences of arrogance and violence. That is how one falls into the trap of the endless circle of self-inflicted misery. So, to have the right theater settings for the scene of the Dark Ages, in the play of the earthly civilizations, first of all, we need ignorance, lots of it. And that's why a certain new philosophy, according to which man sees himself as separate from nature, arose. And I mean connection to nature in a far deeper level than the kindergarten level simplified understanding that we have nowadays. Like, for example, I go out for a picnic, I sit under a tree, I'm connected to nature, I come back home, I'm not connected to nature. In the antiquity, connection with nature was on a completely different level. For example, we know from modern experiments that plants react to various types of music. Well, some people in antiquity could even communicate with the plants using that language. Or, another example, modern experiments show that uh, certain crops in the fields the individual plants also communicate with each other, sending some sort of signals when, for example, predators approach or there is some danger in the vicinity. Well, some people that we would call very primitive were so finely tuned with the environment that they could sense these very subtle signals from the plants. And actually, we are the primitive ones because we know very little about these signals. Actually, plants have a lot more information and they can share it. And some of the people in deep antiquity, they were tuned to the point that they could exchange information with plants and animals. And in some cases, even features of the landscape which, we are convinced, are completely dead. The popular belief nowadays is that there were ancient empires and kingdoms and entire civilizations and they existed during the last couple of thousand years. Actually, it seems all that was packed within the last 1000 years only as shown by the absolutely brilliant research of Anatoly Fomenko. And not only they are much more recent than we are told they were, but some of them didn't even exist at all. Yes, the phenomena called historic doubles has been spotted by many even mainstream historians and they still ponder, hmm, so how is that? We have the same story of the empire, the same events, and they happen in different parts of the world, and even the rulers with same characteristics and same stories emerge at the same um, stage of the development of the empire. So they just say it's strange and leave it aside. But in reality, the explanation of these uh, doubles in history is that 
when during the old ages they destroyed all old books and embarked on writing a new fraudulent history, they needed to find something to put on the place of the thousands of years of deleted history, something that looks more or less believable, plausible. Also, the history fabricators needed only such pieces of history which would strengthen the fate of the masses that the new parasitic reality is the only possible reality. And so they had some suitable material from their parasitic point of view for cooking the new history, but it was relatively recent because they have established their rule relatively recently. So what they did, they had a single event or person and they created numerous doubles of it, cleverly using the fact that the same event was described in different languages. And even the names of the people can sound different in different language. And that is why in the sagas of this fabricated history, which is preached till date, we have one never-ending story of simple people dragged into senseless wars and all kinds of similar miseries by greedy and corrupt rulers. The believers in this history then, of course, are sure that this is the only way. You see, it comes naturally for humans when they get civilized. They believe that the governments can tell them what to do with their lives just because it has always been like this and there is no other way. And they also naively believe that there is no other way but to put up with corrupt governments because, as they think, it becomes clear from history that this is natural and humanity cannot come up with anything better anyway. During the Middle Ages, the situation with the achievements of technology was non different than before. While the majority of the population spent their lives in agricultural pursuits, selected groups still had access to the higher knowledge given by the visiting technologically advanced races. Here, Alexander the Great holds a rocket. Yes, it is well documented that rockets, which rivaled some of the modern ones in terms of performance, were used in the Middle Ages and in deep antiquity. Another example would be some paintings of Leonardo da Vinci. They don't seem to have been made with brush on canvas, because the layer of the paint is just way too thin to have been applied with brush. Or what about Tesla coil electricity in the Middle Ages. The fireworks in this historic depiction do fit in the modern idea that we have of how the Middle Ages were, but the Tesla-style installation and the performance doesn't. Don't be fooled by the penguins with expensive suits who will pretend to wisely look for explanations in terms of what kind of technology did people have in those times. They're just bribed with penguin food and penguin luxuries to lie to you and distract your attention from the obvious truth that back then it was exactly like now, when only closed circles from the military and the corrupt rulers keep fantastic technologies for themselves only, while the masses 
are left to fend for themselves. And for many, that is so under far worse conditions than in the Middle Ages, when at least the local duke will allow you to live peacefully as long as you grow your own food. In the current modern world, millions are expelled from their homelands, forced to feed from trash fields in refugee camps in Africa, in tiny prison cells slash apartments in polluted cities fed with microwaved and canned food. So during the dark age that we live in, the souls on earth are given a chance to face the ugliest thought forms created by them themselves in previous incarnations and now it surfaced. To create a suitable scene of the theater on earth, the forces of evil were given green light to do almost anything they wish. Hell broke loose on earth. The wise, the keepers of the knowledge, were given a choice to either be burned alive or become servants of the dark side. Many millions of the nature people chose, of course, to leave their bodies instead of selling their souls to the devil. In Siberia, they even had a decree. They sentenced to death all elders who were of age of 300 or more. Even as close as a couple of hundred years ago, many people were not yet genetically so modified to die quickly as we do. The human race was downgraded to what we are currently, by introducing new races which were retarded in comparison to the kind of people that lived there before. They mixed with the existing people and we are the result of that mixture, even as close as the Middle Ages. The racial diversity was far greater than now. They were still giants, they were people with elongated skulls, definitely there were dwarves, sometimes mingling with people, and it is only very very recently that we have been reduced to a common denominator. The original humans were very robust and disease resistant, as all creatures in the natural world of course, the benevolent engineers of the earth did not use china quality products so healthy body clear mind that was unbearable for the devilish forces who did creatures appeared at the edges of the villages and cities they sprinkled or sprayed something after the spraying the plague would devour the village or the city this program is still in operation till date Quite few modern research laboratories published works showing that the viruses of the diseases for modern mass destruction were produced in laboratory conditions and not out there in nature. Various so-called vaccinations actually make people autistic, while at the same time wonderful and really healing natural herbs are sold with the obligatory label that this is not meant to heal anything. But that's the case only with the milder ones, the really powerful cures. They are totally banned by laws about the so-called war on drugs, plants allegedly protected by patents or other frauds. There is zero proof of the existence of the so-called Roman Empire, at least in the way we are told the Empire was. The fable was created to attribute to Rome the credit for the magnificent ruins of the ancient cities, the luxury ancient villas with floor heating, the network of precisely built aqueducts and mind-blowing temples like Baalbek had little to do with Rome of Italy. They were built instead by the craftsmen of their respective areas, 
who in their turn were influenced and educated by the Hyperborean line of teachings, or other visiting races, the memory about which has been completely erased. It is very well known amongst modern historians that Rome in the past was a title and did not necessarily refer to Rome a vitae only, but still they are sponsored to always connect it with Rome while they preach to us, although the palaces of the glorified Roman emperors are just petty mudbrick structures compared to the amazing megalithic sites like Baalbek. There is much more high quality stuff and much more ruins in Asia Minor and Northern Africa and not in Europe where they should have been if the stories about the glorious Greco-Romans were true. And why did the European capitals need to have their image boosted? Because in the times that we now call Reformation period, the demonic forces managed to corrupt the human morals to the point that they could make certain governments their puppets and then carry out most hideous atrocities through that medium. Centrally orchestrated and suicidal for the human race wars became the prime medium at this point. Sadly, it is such a waste of time to read the modern version of the medieval history. They distract us with miles-long descriptions for the so-called reasons of the countless wars and massacres of those times. These so-called reasons for all these wars, and for all wars till nowadays, are actually the staged events which trapped the common people, defrauded them to take part in the suicidal wars. Of course, it's always easier to defraud a person who is out of his mind, and that's why the mass alcoholism was forced by various government programs, which run till date. Now they are taken over by the advertisement industry. And still, there were people who figured out the deceit. They were brutally murdered on the main squares. And at the ghastly scenes of their corpses, people were read governmental decrees, which told the people which is the correct history you must believe in or be the next corpse on the square. This practice with the decrees runs till modern days. For example, the Second World War, we still have live witnesses. So what if they start talking about how things really were during that war. That is why in the countries where witnesses and other evidence can emerge, there are strict laws which forbid and ban any discussion of the official version of the history of the war. And surprise, surprise, exactly about the events about which discussion is forbidden, evidence emerges that the official history is highly questionable. What a coincidence that it is exactly those events. We live in a magical world full of coincidences, don't we? The righteous kings of the old times, who were indeed representatives of God in one sense, were replaced by insurgent kings. This project started in medieval Europe and quickly engulfed almost the entire earth. Still, that was for the rulers only. The common people remain convinced that high morals and an honorable life were the ways of normal humans. It is hard to say now how much of that educational work was done by the Hyperborean line, how much by the other races, and how much of by individual speakers who would descend 
to enlighten on a more local and limited scale. We can't say that because all of the old books were destroyed or hidden during the Middle Ages. They were substituted with forged copies, where the meaning itself was twisted beyond recognition. These are the copies which the modern historians, the penguins, wave in our faces and tell us that these are the authentic, genuine books. So the situation with the high level of the morals of the people was unbearable for the bloodthirsty forces of darkness. Quickly, they organized armies and embarked on a worldwide slaughter, which in the modern history books is cunningly depicted as a chain. It is as if unrelated local events, the result of local skirmishes, and the hideous genocide of the local tribes of both Americas actually had nothing to do with colonialism. Even if the actual soldiers who carried out the atrocities on the field believed that it is colonialism. If we, the generations who come afterwards, want to get out of the vicious, endless circle of suicidal wars, we will have to recognize the truth behind the reasons of all centrally orchestrated wars. Other genocides are barely mentioned in the commonly known history, like that of Europe, wrongly associated with some religious reformation. It had nothing to do with that. South Africa, India, Siberia. How many people are even aware of them? What to speak of their extent or reason? In Northern and Central Asia, the nature people of the old times managed to escape the onslaughts of the dark forces for a very short time. And they even gathered an army which went all the way to Europe and reclaimed the lands which were under parasitic rule at that time. And we, we hear about this in the modern history. It is called the invasion of Genghis Khan. Was it really an invasion or just a reclaim. We don't know, but certainly the Genghis Khan forces had little to do with Mongolia. Yes, Mongolia was part of the kingdom of the Great Khan, as they called it in that time, but it was a very small part of it. Again, um, the modern information is based on twisting the meaning of archaic words and mixing them with modern meanings. Europe was conquered by the Mongols, which is different from the nowadays Mongolians, very peaceful people who could have never gathered an army that could reach Europe, what to speak of conquering it. But yes, Mongolia derived its name from the Mongols. The words definitely have the same root. And there were Mongols all over Asia all the way from India to Siberia. But speaking about the army of Genghis Khan, which took over Europe, in the contemporary texts that was described as consisting of blonde Mughals. Those people had their empire. It was called Tartaria in West European sources. We don't know how did the people themselves call themselves because the cleanup of local history was meticulously executed in Siberia. But the Genghis Khan victory was short-lived. Soon, the rule of the great Khan of Asia was no longer Recognized in Europe, his forces were drawn back. Tartaria was split into numerous smaller pieces, which subsequently were brought down gradually, one by one. We are told that Napoleon went all the way to Russia and fought with Russia. That's what we are told now. But the most recent research 
shows contemporary descriptions of the war, which only recently became accessible to the general public in digital form. And how interesting, the people of that time, of the newly created Russia, they did not fight Napoleon, they fought together with Napoleon against the last few pieces of Tartaria. That same Napoleon who went to Egypt to destroy as many ruins as possible. Napoleon is glorified nowadays, but I don't see any grounds for that except this straightforward and honest quote from him. In the older times, people had rites and celebrations devoted to nature, to the pulse of the earth, which they still felt. In modern times, they were replaced by national holidays, commemorating how the dark forces tricked us into certain bloody battle or war. Commemorating such events means giving our energy to them, making them to some extent an object of our meditation, creating further thought forms, which sooner or later in this life or the next will fructify in the form of real events, then we'll call it bad luck which is upon us. Just like herds, they gather us at squares and town halls. Then we are force-fed Machiavellian lies to make us feed and nurture the thought forms of violence and the conviction, the deep-rooted conviction that the life as an obedient sheep is the only option, the puppet sheep which stands on the elevated place will not hesitate even to summon us to nurture the violent thought forms in the name of our forefathers who died and suffered heroically for our future. Yeah, what kind of future do they mean? Imagine your grand-grand-grandfather really participated in a war. Probably he was drafted against his own will. Would he be really happy watching his grand-grand-grandson from heaven, hopefully, repeat his own mistakes and perpetuate the dark future by endorsing further wars? Now the entire beautiful Hyperborean region was rendered uninhabitable due to instant freezing. But even in the Middle Ages, the climate was still much more pleasant than now. On photographs, palms grow in Moscow. Elephants are captured on photographs plowing the fields of Russia. Russia is a famous pineapple exporter. On medieval maps of Iceland, at locations which are now permanently frozen with glaciers, there were agricultural farms. Initially, the historians didn't believe these maps, and they made even expeditions to the spots marked as farms, and indeed found them below the ice cover. It seems that around almost 200 years ago, the earth was made even harder to inhabit. It was made even colder. There were a couple of years in that time without summer. The crops died, animals and people starved. Now we are told that it was all because of some far distant volcano. But that hypothesis, when examined close, doesn't hold water. A group of researchers are really looking into this lately, and they have gathered a good amount of facts pointing towards a possible nuclear bombing at that time. They found and measured the radiation at quite few round-looking craters of unknown origin. These craters are highly radioactive. So when did that bombing 
take place, such high levels of nuclear radiation cannot be retained for really extended periods, so lost ancient civilizations are not to be blamed this time. Most likely we are experiencing a nuclear winter since about 200 years, which was reinforced and perpetuated by the numerous nuclear tests during the Cold War times. It's getting slightly warmer now, the ice cap start to melt slowly. The party which launched the weapons which caused the freezing is not happy about that. And that's why we see this venomous, blasphemous smear campaign against even slight global warming. This campaign, as we know, serves not only as a background and an excuse for the various financial scams to be run in the name of keeping the earth cold, but also such campaigning is meant to create negative thought forms in the minds of the common people. They want us to be negative towards the idea of our earth becoming a pleasant habitat again of moderate temperatures. And it's not just the suspicious craters. Countless cities built in so-called neoclassical style were buried deep in mud, in clay, at places two stories high. That also is a result of something, we are not even sure what, that happened in the skies during that period of the years without summer. So, two points in the very recent history of the Earth seem to stand out. One is 1000 years ago, the beginning of the Dark Age of Violence, and then a crucial moment of about 200 years ago also repeatedly comes up in absolutely unrelated sources. So, before that time, we had other races of bigger people who also lived longer, Apparently, this war slash disaster really changed the face of the Earth. That time is also mentioned by Set as important because more or less it coincides with the so-called Industrial Revolution, when man completely divorced himself from nature and hastily started implementing newer and newer technologies which corner him into becoming a remotely controlled robot of the new province of hell called Earth. There is a very strict monitoring system which suppresses any technology which could make the life of the masses independent and self-sufficient. The first commercial model of a solar car was ready 100 years ago, it could run for 3 hours at the speed of 20 miles per hour. There are countless of functional modern models, and yet the industry is suppressed to such an extent that even a single one did not get commercially distributed. Not to mention the free electricity of Tesla and the star batteries yet another option for almost free electricity. In the older times, the nature people would fashion their dwellings inside the rock. Thus, the dwellings were well insulated and protected, and also they were extremely durable. Many, many generations could use them and didn't need to work hard to build new homes again and again. Since people were well tuned with nature and, as we found recently, stone can be cultivated like mushroom plants, it is even possible that some races could grow big chunks of stone and then fashion their dwellings inside it while it was relatively soft. Gradually the stone dwellings gave way to huge megaliths 
megalithic blocks which would fit each other with amazing precision. Not sure if that was a sign of improvement or of devolution, but from that point on, the devolution is obvious. The megalithic stones get smaller and smaller. The precision with which they, the stones fit each other gets less and less. As the dark age advanced and the minds of the people got foggier and foggier, they even forgot the techniques of how to make the stones fit with each other. The gaps between stones became so big that the wind could blow through and that's why they had to use mortar. And then we invented the bricks. That's even flimsier than small loose stone. Since the brick buildings fall apart very quickly, this is a convenient way to create perpetual work for the people so that they don't have time to think. And of course, they are centrally dependent on building materials. And of course, the modern building materials, at least those that are freely available and accessible for the masses, there is always environmental pollution involved in their production. Life on Earth currently is very polarized, so to say. Some live in luxury, others spend their days in starvation, depending on the thought forms that they have nurtured in previous incarnations. Although the Dark Age is against everything godly, it is not against God, because God was engineer of the evil as well. And while all souls on earth enjoy or suffer while they learn their earthly lessons, some of the more sensitive amongst them start to feel the wind of change. The souls of the speakers continued to incarnate onto the earthly plane even in the dark age and the latest messages that we get from them indicate that the dark age will be coming to an end soon the thick blanket of ignorance will be lifting in decades not within hundreds of years <laughs> So, okay, the idea of the New Age is interesting, but how, it, how can it be practical? The parasitic way of life has grown into such a cancer, like one of those nasty cancers that spread their tentacles of disease to each and every organ, and it's impossible to remove them even surgically anymore because you have to cut all the organs if you want to remove them. It may look hopeless, but let's not forget what Edgar Casey told us. Unless there is interference from what may be called by many the supernatural forces and influences that are active in the affairs of nations and peoples, the whole world, as it were, will be set on fire by the militaristic groups and those that are for power and expansion in such associations. And the message of some other prophets who have proven themselves appear to be the same. So let's see now another source, the people in trance who visit their future lives. The same technique of regression is used for progression, visiting future incarnations. As far as the next five or even ten years, no major changes are to be expected. But then, let's say in a hundred years, the results of the progressions are quite interesting. Yes, people do get reborn, but when they describe the earth on which they get born again, it is quite shocking because half of them report unbelievable 
pollution and radiation from nuclear skirmishes. People can't breathe anymore. They try to build domes with clean air and eventually they even leave the earth and they go to live in space because although life is not completely exterminated it's earthly life becomes unbearable and yet other half of the people describe being born on a beautiful green earth humanity has come back to its senses and the dark age of the stupid wars is a closed chapter of the history People simply woke up from the nightmare of the parasitic reality. So I want to insert a small explanation note. These future life progressions, they should not be regarded as pure fantasy. There are recorded cases by the progression professionals in which people see events that would be impossible to just guess and they do happen afterwards. And I'm not talking about minor events which could also be a product of wishful thinking just because you read the prediction. I'm talking about things like uh, somebody saw uh, an explosion, a large accident which happened in a manufacturing unit for uh, flammable substances and it was caused by the failure of somebody from the staff to wash his hands properly. And that event was seen in a past life progression sessions many years before it took place. So the information obtained from such sources of future progressions can't be just dismissed as fantasy. But in this case it's a bit difficult to interpret for example, those who are suffocating in extreme pollution, they are forced to go and live in orbit circling the Earth. Couldn't they go to the places where the New Age people live in peace and enjoy nature? Is it even possible that on half of the Earth you can't even go outside anymore without wearing a gas mask? While on the other half, people can't get enough from the beautiful clear skies, the crystal clear water and the wonderful wild fruits. Is it really possible that people who are overloaded with thought forms of darkness at one point continue to live in a completely different parallel reality while those who turn back and revive the ways of the old nature people. They continue their lives again on earth, but in a different layer. Or maybe these visions from the progressions, they simply show two possible futures for the entire humanity. And we will all go down only one of these roads. In the past, the history was a subject for shamans who had practical on-hand experience of visiting other dimensions and coming back. History doesn't seem to be linear. There seem to be splitting of realities, of timelines, then merging between them and even leakages between them. Currently, I see no point even to open a discussion about those because we can't get straight even the linear, highly simplistic representation of history. Even in that linear model, most of the events older than some 200 years are simply fantasy, historic fiction, propaganda of the dark forces. And by the way, and the cancer of ignorance is not at all incurable. Once we stop feeding it with our ignorance, arrogance and alcoholism, it will depart by itself, voluntarily. It will go looking for a job elsewhere. <laughs>